Welcome to Global Agenda. To tackle the challenges of rapid urbanization and mobility, governments and businesses are having their attentions turned to a key concept known as MOS, or Mobility as a Service. Now, this involves uh, integrating various ways of transportation to make access to mobility easier for the consumer. And if I may introduce one example. This is a phone app that is used in Helsinki, Finland, one of the leader leaders of Moz. And as you can see, you put in your current destination and where you want to go, and then it will give you multiple transportation options. Now, this includes car sharing, bike sharing, ride hailing, uh, public transportation systems such as uh, trains, buses. And depending on where you want to go, it will give you a combination maybe of even some of those different transportation options. And once you've decided which route you want to go with, you can also make the payment online for every part of that travel. Now, this is of course one way that Moss is supposed to be convenient for people who will be using the system. But more importantly, is mobility really sustainable and inclusive for all members of society. And that's what I would like to be discussing with our panelists today. Thank you all for joining me. And as Moz, of course, uh, spreads around the world, we have different things to talk about, whether it is really a game changer for uh, transportation as a whole. And of course, we call the um, whole uh, change in mobility, a mobility revolution. Now, is this really a revolution that will benefit all or not? First of all, I'd like to start with Anish. Thank you very much. Uh, Anish, um, coming from a major car manufacturer in India, how is your company approaching Moss? We feel that Moss is here to stay. It is something that is going to revolutionize transportation in many ways. Uh, we would look at it as uh, different modules, really. So the first module that we look at is technology that's enabling this. A lot of the other factors were in play already. Right? The second big module is ride sharing. How do you share assets better? How do you enable people to, uh, to get from place A to B easier and, and in a more affordable way because you're sharing assets? Uh, that ride sharing can be four wheelers or it can be at the last mile, uh, which often can be more inclusive, whether it's two wheelers or three wheelers or going from a train station to an office hub. Uh, the third component on that is electric. And this is something that uh, technically doesn't really fit into mass. You could do mass without the electric component, but it goes back to what we started with earlier, which is cities are concerned about congestion, about pollution, and that is something that's solved by electric, So, which is where that's thrown into the mix as well. And often these solutions are looked at as cleaner solutions if done with electric. Uh, and then the fourth one to take care of congestion is autonomous. So those are the four modules really that Mass is about. And we see that becoming reality. Uh, in what time frame we can debate it. All of us will have different views on what the time frame is. Uh, and not only auto manufacturers, various other parts of the ecosystem will have to adjust and uh, be ready for the future. Thank you. Uh, Megan. Megan Flo, and you are coming from the perspective of a not-for-profit social enterprise, um, not from the car industry directly or transportation industry, but how would you define sustainable mobility? Well, I think that I look at mobility in this context and I think about the way that we design our infrastructure is a message to people about their own social mobility. And it sends a pretty strong message, actually, about what society believes in and what we're going to stand for. So it is very concerning for me, the conversation around mobility, because I think it has a direct link on the ever-pressing issue that we are all dealing with around equality and people's sense of inequality, whether that's as a digital divide, whether that's as an educational divide, an opportunity divide. So this question of mobility, it's not just about how we get around. It's about the message we're sending to, to people about how important their aspirations are and how are we going to enable those aspirations in the best possible way. And Pradeep, now as a leading global transportation network company, do you see Moz as a major business opportunity? 
You know, the origin of Uber uh, is in this notion of replacing private vehicle ownership. Um, there's just a fascinating stat in India, and the 30 million passenger vehicles uh, in India, of which half a million is now transporting more than one person. On an average, every time a vehicle is on the road, there is 1.1 person in it. And anybody who has traversed in Indian cities over the last 10 years, the average speed of moving in a city, in Bangalore as an example, has gone from 14 kilometers per hour, which wasn't great, to nine. Uh, and frankly, cities are dying. And I would argue mass is a social requirement. Of course, it's a tremendous business opportunity and that there's no doubt Uber was conceived out of this idea of creating mobility as a service. Uh, but the need is not really commercial. Frankly, this is something that society has to solve for so we can keep our cities livable uh, for the people who live there. I have uh, two children, 10 and 7, both are asthmatic, grow up in, in Delhi, and vehicle pollution is one of the biggest reasons why uh, they suffer from that. And I'm sure we'll all agree that we all have to play a big part in, in changing that for the next uh, generations to come. So absolutely a big business opportunity, but equally a massive social priority. Right. Um, massive social priority. Uh, we see that, which is probably why the cities, governments, uh, businesses are all moving in that direction. But uh, is it really that easy? Uh, I'd like to talk about the challenges, and I think we've already sort of started to uh, touch on some of that. Uh, there are definitely challenges to introducing such a sustainable and inclusive system. Take, well, Delhi, you spoke about, for example, uh, air pollution, traffic congestion. These are some concerns, of course, that this capital shares, along with many other capitals around the world. Uh, but, you know, if you think about having to delete personal cars from this picture, which is basically kind of what Moss is about, right? We are talking about whether we go for public transportation or we keep these personal cars. But uh, what do we mean by replacing these personal cars for a better service, which Moz is supposed to be mo mobility as a service. So what is that service? What is that experience that will go beyond having a personal means of transportation, first, first of all, to Pradeep? So I think uh, you asked the question, which I think is the hardest question to solve for. It's easy to say we want to replace uh, private ownership. Frankly, with what? You need to replace it with something that, in our uh, minds, does three things. One, it's reliable, which means that it is available when you want it mm -hmm. within a reasonable period of time. And it has to be all the time for every citizen. Second, it's got to be affordable, which means that it's a social good. It's, it's to me, no different from food, electricity, housing. Transport is a basic social need. And so you have to think about this as an affordable uh, service that we are providing. And affordability means, obviously, different things to different people. And the last thing, it's got to be sustainable, which means that it's got to play its part uh, in reducing pollution and in decongesting cities. All of those three things have to be provided, which means the solution really is not necessarily only one mode of transport. It doesn't need to be only cars or only buses or only trains. But public transit is a huge part of whatever solution you think about. Last mile connectivity is a big part of the solution. Uh, and I'd argue electric, as Anish said, has to be a big part of the solution. So if you pull these things together, you probably can create an ecosystem which makes it affordable, reliable, and sustainable. But uh, Uber, doesn't it rely on, uh, well, in a way, cars? And uh, it may not be a personal device, but um, the more, even though they may be electrical, the more there are, that too could lead to congestion. So I think this is a very pertinent question. If you follow the public press and the announcements we've been making, I'd say over the last 12 months, uh, there are a number of things that will give you a clear signal that Uber is not a car company anymore. Car is one of the modes of transport, but we have integrated public transit now onto our systems. You've seen the announcements that we have made in cities like Denver, where you can book public transit or at least discover public options similar to the app that you uh, showed us about uh, Helsinki. That's one example. India is a great example. Our fastest growing service is two-wheelers and three-wheelers, most of which is focused on providing last-mile connectivity. And um, 
pretty much every electric vehicle that's viable today in India is already on our platform on a test basis. Mm. So we are investing to learn and figure out how to make this work. So for us, Uber is not only about being a car service, but it's a transportation service which probably will integrate multiple modes of transport. Well, Anish, coming from a car company, uh, again, if I may say, Moz seems to contradict with personal car ownership. For a car manufacturer, how does this play? Not just cars, but we are in 20 different industries today, and we see almost all of them being threatened by some form of technology evolution. Mm. It's a financial services, you could talk about fintech and agri, you could talk about agri-tech, there's a whole host of things. And uh, that's, in many ways, a great place to be. In many ways, it's a really bad place to be. Right? It's great because it allows us to get ahead of things and, and define the industries. Uh, and it's bad because, yes, it's threatening in, in, in uh, different forms. So from a car standpoint, our industry is going to change. Uh, we look at where this industry will be in terms of objects of mobility and objects of, um, in some ways, I would say, uh, people that want something that is beyond their regular mobility. Um, so objects of desire. Those objects will continue over time. Now the question is, how do you supply both? And in many ways, how do you get into different forms of the mass system as well? Because the exciting part here is that while all the challenges exist, the demand is there today. It's about figuring out the supply. For a consumer, it's great to be able to pull out a phone and say, I want to go from place A to B, this is how I go there. Now the question is, who's going to be a winner in that space is not known as yet. Mm -hmm. right? Uber certainly ha has a great lead on it. Google may come in over Uber at some point in time, right? or someone else might. Today, I would look at Google very often in New York or various other places to see how to take a subway from place A to B, and they will start integrating other forms of transportation in there as well. So there are going to be multiple players in this space that, that go on. So the industry is going to get completely upended. If you look at electric cars, uh, the components required for a car are a fraction of what's required for ICE cars. The entire component industry in cars is going to change. So we're looking at a major transformation that's taking place. So for us, you know, we look at it as an exciting time. Mm. We look at it as one that we've got to understand various different parts of it. Uh, we are playing in almost every single part of it in some form and uh, trying to figure out where do we invest more. It's a classic case of what I call optionality. So place a certain chips on the table in, in various different forms. And then if you see something taking off further, then make greater investments there. Uh, so it, it's a fun game. Do you think other companies that uh, rely on oil-driven vehicles or, you know, for example, oil companies, like do you think they see this revolution in the same way you just mentioned? I would say everyone does. Mm. Right? If you look at what auto companies around the world are doing, uh, they're investing in different forms or components of mass in a significant way. There is a fair amount of consolidation that's starting to take place, alliances that are starting to take place in the auto industry. So the industry is shaping up for it. So I, I would not say that we stand out versus everyone else. Uh, I do see uh, various different auto manufacturers uh, conscious about it and, and ready to take on the challenge. Mm. Megan, hmm. uh, if what uh, Pradeep and Anish have been talking about is a shared view across uh, the transportation industry. I think that would be a very positive sign for quite a few people. But uh, what do you see as the challenges and, of course, the mindsets of people who use this transportation? Yeah, <clears throat> I think we have an utterly different issue ahead of us. And it's an issue that has an extremely short timeline to solve. And it's the issue of aspirations. The places in the world where we most need to address the transport issue and mobility are the places in the world where owning a car is still an aspiration. And it's seen as the sign of success financially and in many other ways. Largely because it's always been linked to an ability to move around. But now it's way beyond that. In fact, I know somebody in Switzerland who does not own a car. He does not need to own a car in Switzerland. The public transport system is brilliant. However, everybody I know who knows him comments on the fact he does not own a car. Mm. Until we start to shift our aspirational mentality 
to one that is in line with what the planet can support, I think we are going to continue to run in circles around this problem. The cities that I see, Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, Cape Town, Johannesburg, uh, Lagos, Jakarta, if you spend one day in these cities, you understand we are absolutely out of time to solve this issue. The, the second thing I'd like to bring up is about the technology, the platform itself. So you just showed that beautiful app. If you can't read and write, you can't use that app. Here in Delhi, a third of the people who need to use public transport, probably even more, cannot read and write. The same in Lagos, Nigeria. The same in Dar es Salaam. So this is a networked and connected problem, I would say, that deals and touches on many different things. So we have to come together. I really see it as an opportunity for us to come together, to be co-designing from the point of the beneficiary, the user, such that we are actually taking a systems change approach to a system and network problem. I don't think we're in the day on this issue where one company or one solution or one platform is going to be a one-size-fits-all. So I think that's, that's really strongly how I feel now about designing into these kind of complex problems that are both environmental, human, and affect our eco economies dramatically. May I say, um, uh, Megan, I, your point on this becoming a system problem to solve is absolutely the right one. It is too large a problem for any one entity to solve. On the point of our aspiration, I am, I am actually quite optimistic. Um, we just uh, did a study with, uh, uh, with uh, a consulting firm where we went out and asked millennials on their desire around automotive ownership. And it's actually quite shocking how quickly they moved on from this idea of needing to own an asset. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I think there is a definitely seems to me that there is an urban-rural divide, which I think is a big one to recognize. But there is hope in that I don't think young people put as, as much stock in owning a vehicle. It seems like owning any sort of asset, but definitely owning a vehicle. And that's something that I think is a, is a space for us to build on. Yeah. Would you like to comment on? Yeah, let me just share um, a, an advertisement by Zoomcar. Okay. I, I must claim that we have an investment in the company, so with that <laughs> disclaimer. Uh, it, it was a fascinating advertisement. You had this couple uh, standing on the foothills of a beautiful mountain in the snow, and uh, the guy goes down on his knees and uh, sort of offers a ring and says, will you be mine for 12 months? And you could see a grimace on, on the girl's face, and he says, six months, and she smiles, <laughs> right? And the ad says, afraid of commitment? Get a Zoom car for six months. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're right. It is starting to move towards less commitment. I don't want to buy things. I don't want... Uh, so, Megan, your solutions may be closer than you think. <laughs> That's encouraging. Right. You think? Well, now that we're on this topic of... right. Um, are they going to create further divides among people? Moz could have that, that possibility couldn't it? Um, we are talking about urban areas because usually urbanization and the concept of moss come together. But are we really supposed to only talk about urban areas? What about the rural areas? Or, or are these rural areas going to remain rural areas? I think this all needs to be thought about. And that's the part of society that perhaps we are cutting off when we introduce concepts like moss. Anyone want to start? With that? Go ahead. Um, I was just going to come at it from the rural point of view because obviously that's, that's where I work and, and that's what I see on a daily basis. And I think that um, one of the challenges is that it never works to take an urban solution and just suddenly plonk it in a rural area because the needs of rural people are, are pretty dramatically different. And actually, they don't want to migrate to the city. Um, that's you know sort of a global misnomer. Rural people would stay in rural areas if the way of life was enabled, if economies were enabled, if villages were strong and self-sufficient and able to provide opportunity, and if we actually started to reinvest also in rural areas um, at the rate we're investing in, in our cities right now. So 
I see that um, it is an opportunity for us to really start to allow communities to have a voice in what it is they need, what will enable them economically, what the kinds of solutions that will work for them. In some ways, I can see electric being adopted hugely faster in rural areas than it actually is in urban areas and a great business opportunity because there are no charging kiosks. So this is already a, a, a thought in my head. We, we took in a very, very rural uh, place in Rajasthan three electric vehicles um, and the staff immediately adopted them because rural people really resonate with the environment. They really resonate with efficiency, with cost, with not spending on things they don't need to spend on. So the adoption time is extremely fast. Even women? Um, yes, I, know I have women great. drivers. Okay, <laughs> no, just because, uh, yes, I'm just wondering how much the transport system, well, mainly if we start talking about public transportation, of course, this doesn't mean just men, obviously. Yeah. But when we think about car use, somehow there is that sort of image of the masculinity of the industry. Um, so again, I'm saying with electric vehicles or other modes of transport, how are the women, children, or yeah. other parts of society, people in all parts of society, are they all going to be accessing mm -hmm. uh, these modes of transport in the same way? Do you no, I, I think... Clearly, women um, have a huge uh, challenge right now in terms of public transport in the developing world. This is consistent across the developing world. Issues of security, issues of uh, mo their own social mobility to be able to access that transport because of the perceptions around that. Um, we have an amazing organization here in Delhi called Women on Wheels, uh, for those of you who haven't heard of it, that trains women drivers who then drive only women and families. And that has opened up a, a huge opportunity, I think, and additional mobility for people. I think also the issue of disability, of inclusion uh, in systems that are enabled with uh, the physically challenged in mind is, is something essential and you know, something that is a, another huge business opportunity. So these things are opportunities for us to not only design equality into uh, accessibility, but also to send a message um, about a standard, a way of building infrastructure that is actually um, one that will provide, you know, a positive uh, impression about commitment of resources in a public sense, even if it's a private uh, mechanism that gets it there. These situations. I'd say that uh, inclusiveness is a very important aspect, and it's not just rural. It's even in urban areas. In fact, more so in urban areas. We look at the fraction of consumers that travel in cars today, it's a very tiny fraction. So mass really has to solve this for consumers at, uh, the, at the mass stage. That's something that requires integration with public transportation. Uh, that requires last mile solutions. It's the rickshaws or e-rickshaws as we have now, uh, taking people from a station to an office hub. Uh, it's the bicycle sharing that allows people to take a bicycle as you walk out of their house and then take that and travel to a bus station or potentially a train station. So these are the solutions that really need to be worked on in a more integrated manner. Uh, that is starting to happen. Uh, we've got a number of pilots in, in many cases in this, but it's not happening at scale as yet. Uh, and that has to start catching up. Go ahead. this, um, you know, the the possibility that this can happen has existed only for the last four or five years. After technology has been deployed at the scale that it's been deployed. That, but I can see so many green shoots. I'll give you three examples. Uh, one, we launched a bike service in India, which is uh, uh, called Ubermoto. Uh, we don't have precise information, but by what we see, roughly one out of four riders are women. Mm. Before we launched the service, I had a number of people uh, assert that, that women in India would be very uncomfortable sitting behind uh, a, a bike, a taxi a driver uh, because it's a, it's a close physical space. 
As it turns out, women are adopting the service. First, it's because it's convenient, it's reliable, and in their perception, it's safer because it's open and it's, uh, uh, it's you know, it perceived as safer than other modes of transport. One example. Uh, let's take a non-Uber example. There's a company that's coming up in the US for us who have children. Uh, school transport is a very big issue because we are very concerned about safety. Uh, are we able to track them? Are they in safe modes of transport? Are the drivers good, et cetera? The service in the US is built on Uber as a platform, so it uses the tech, but they do a number of things on top of that, of the nature that you talked about, Megan, uh, which provides service that provides greater sense of uh, comfort and reliability. That's another example. Uh, and lastly, let's take the job creation aspect, which is if you take out all of our courier partners, people deliver food, and this is not just Uber, but across all food delivery platforms, the number of women who are participating, uh, they work four hours, six hours, eight hours, in a flexible way that's built around their life. So they have certain sets of duties to be done as it relates to potentially the kids or the families. Uh, and this, by the way, is not an India thing. We see this everywhere around the emerging world. And they have time where they want to figure out ways to be economically productive, they're just able to take a two-wheeler, which is relatively accessible, and use that to create uh, economic opportunity. So there are many ways that the platform can be used. Uh, the tech needs to be available and accessible to everybody. But I, I'm actually quite hopeful that uh, private entrepreneurship will create many of these things solving very specific problems. Which is actually where I'd like to start talking a bit about um collaborations or, or the balance between working with governments, whether it be regional, whether it be national. Um, obviously, when we talk about infrastructure, it can't just be about private uh, companies. Well, I mean, it could perhaps, but you know, where, where it starts, it could start from the government side, it could start from the private sector. But can we, we can't take out either part of um, the balance, can't we? Um, would anyone like to start from there? I, I just don't see uh, big modes of transportation and revolutions and mobility taking that part of the uh, equation out. I think, uh, I don't know, I, now the microphone's gone. Um, I think we, we work in a, in a very comprehensive model that is always working with government uh, on advocacy and policy change at the same time we're working on, a, on building a particular initiative. And I mean, I have really found uh, that landscape to have changed a great deal in the last sort of three to five years. I see government much more willing to engage in different types of partnerships, partnerships that are with private sector, that are with social entrepreneurs, that are with civil society. So I think we have to all be advocates and really push for that. It never works to go somewhere without government. Right, because at a certain point you need them. You need them to regulate, you need them to scope, you need them to create policy that enables you to go further and, and faster. And so you can't sort of wait till the 11th hour to bring them on board and get them smart about what you're doing. This just never works. So we have to be respectful with each of the pillars. Um, if you think about uh, you know, the three pillars of society, uh, government, uh, private sector, and and community. Uh, I think that that is the lesson for the 22nd century in terms of partnership is um, not to disempower any of those, not to not respect them, and, and to really leverage their strengths. Government has a lot to lend us in terms of data and reach and ways of communicating and ways of getting people to comply because we're talking about social behavior change here that is aligned with a business model, but we are really talking about as we move towards mass as a viable option, either rural or, or urban, as human behavioral change. Well, human beings only change their behavior for two reasons, because there's an incentive or because there's a sanction or penalty. So government can act as a brilliant mechanism in that cocktail, and I think we, we have to think about them positively. And here in India, government is, is being extremely clear, I think, in the way they're moving. Uh, they want to privatize much more uh, the management of some of these kinds of services uh, and infrastructure items, and they are significantly, I think, going to move in that direction uh, increasingly now, so we had best be prepared, guys. <laughs> I feel there are three important things for the government to focus on. <coughs> three important things. One is standards. 
especially given a large space where you have a large number of private players, uh, there is a need to set standards, electric charging, for example. Right? There are various different technologies. If you've got different players putting in different infrastructure, it's not going to work, or it's going to be much slower and a lot more expensive from a collective standpoint. The second part is um, addressing what I would call the perils of a winner-take-all model. Right? We referred to it earlier in terms of affordability. I would put economic sustainability there. Right? A winner-take model sometimes has a peril of companies subsidizing to a large extent today in the hope of reaping profits in the future. So the government has to play a role in ensuring that affordability is maintained at a sustainable level and it does not change once you have a monopoly in place. And the third is data privacy. Uh, this model has, again, the peril of data being potentially misused. So what are the standards and safeguards around data privacy? So those are the three key areas where I see the government having to play a significant role. Interesting you mentioned affordability and keeping a sort of standard for that because, um, you know, if coming from a private business, uh, you would think that as competition... Um, you, it would be difficult for you to think of that as one. Of course, I mean, generally speaking, for the sustainability of mobility itself, it's necessary. But from a business standpoint, uh, it's interesting that that opinion comes from you, Anish. Yeah, it's something that is essential for the future of mass. If you set up a mass system today anywhere and suddenly the prices have gone up 2x in two years' time, right, that's not sustainable. So that's going to result in some problem down the road. So while we very much advocate less governance wherever possible and letting the private sector play, I think there is a need for certain safeguards to be put in place to ensure that we have a sustainable model for the future. Data privacy, he mentioned. Yeah, I, I maybe just a couple of things to add, Anish, to your list of three things. I do think government has a really important role to play in policy making, And I will say this uh, knowing that we are in such early stages of this transformation of a multi-trillion dollar industry that is used by every single human being on earth. Transport is a service like that. And which means that you have to be very careful to create enough of a regulatory sandbox to allow the technologies and the innovators to play out. The biggest risk, frankly, I see is that you stifle innovation uh, and it is often well-intentioned, but without understanding the second and third order effects of those decisions. So I think the role that the government plays in making sure regulations are constructive and protects the interest at first of the consumer. It has to be for the end user. As long as it protects the interest of the consumer and is, is for good of society, I think those governing principles uh, have to be in place, but you need space to be able to innovate. Uh, and that, I think, is an important thing to keep in mind just in the environment we are in. I think that's one. Second, uh, I want to expand a little bit, Megan, uh, your point around data. Um, London is a great example. Uh, if you look at the Lon London Transit Authority, it actually allows its data to be publicly used. There are 8,000 developers that use that data for various sources of public good. Public transit planning, urban planning, where do you build roads, where do you expand roads, where do you build bridges? Uh, it's appalling, obviously, to see the state of data use in many, many countries and how infrastructure gets built because this infrastructure is really expensive. And so you want to make sure that you have used data in the best possible way. And here, again, it's not data flowing one way, right? This has got to be data flowing not just between the government and the private parties, but how do you do it in a way that's accessible to anybody who wants to innovate with, the, with enough rules around, around data privacy. And the third role that the government has to play at least in markets where there are large-scale government subsidies in place. You really have to question what's the best way to allocate public resources for maximum good. And I'd argue that we haven't visited that question in a long time in a country like India. And there must be better ways. If you look at uh, France as a great example, outside of Nice, we have a partnership with the state municipality where we co-opt and provide quote-unquote public transit services. And that fills in gaps that exist in the existing public infra, because if the government were to provide it, it is just way more expensive. And it probably is not the best user of taxpayer money. So I think the government has uh, a few other roles to play in addition to all of the, all of the ones that uh, Anisha and Megan mentioned. You mentioned the, for example, in London, the 8,000 developers who have access to uh, private data. Yeah. 
Are we sure that's safe? As in, I know there are many safety issues when we talk about innovation. Innovation, of course, should not be stopped by uh, you know certain forms of information. But then again, for the end user, sh we need to feel safe about being able to use these systems. Are we sure we're safe when it's openly in the hands of many different people? And you know, I think this is a question it's not just in the transport space oh, no. right obviously the amount of data that's available in the public domain in the world of uh, social that we live in with particularly that being aggregated to anisha's point in the hands of very few people uh, it is absolutely an issue of the highest importance and uh, i think you will see now increasingly language from many of the companies that hold the data that actually is calling for the governments to play a more active role mm -hmm. which you know I'd argue a few years back you'd never hear that. And I think it's increasingly with the recognition that there needs to be better safeguards in place so that people can trust that while there is good coming out of all of these services, there's also bad that could happen if this is not controlled. So we are very much in the camp of again finding constructive ways to keep data protected in all possible ways. I think this is a topic that will see a tremendous amount of movement in, in just the very near future. So then do you feel, which is something I want to expand to, of course, the other panelists as well, but uh, do you feel that the Moz platform should basically be led by which side, the, the government or by the private sector? Of course, the people at the end, but who should be really the driving force behind all this? I'm happy to take a cut. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I, I, it's not clear to us that the governments are the best operators of systems like this. And that's a stance that's not just in transport, but it's been taken across multiple industries. Uh, and I'd, if you look, think about what the government in India, as an example, is saying increasingly, is we don't want to be the operators of things. And so um, I'd argue that the private sector has an important role to play, again, within a certain set of frameworks, guardrails, precautions that are laid out in a regulatory framework. Anish, um, for example, when it comes to smart cities, and many of them are uh, you know, uh, coming into play these days, regional governments are working on their own cities and making them into smart ones. Uh, but there again, you know, if that's the case, and I know Mahindra has been working in, um, in that realm as well, how do you see the balance? I see this as a collaborative partnership. And... I see this as multiple private players because if you just look at mass, today it's a collection of various different things that exist in some form. Someone's going from their home to a train station. Someone's going from their home to an office directly. So that's being provided in some form. Now, mass is just making it simpler, easier. Technology makes it easier for you to say, how do I go from place A to B faster? A shared service makes it more affordable. Electric makes it cleaner. So there are different aspects that are just making it easier overall. Therefore, I don't see someone coming in and taking over that entire space. Infrastructure is important. A private company cannot run public transport. Um, it's going to be difficult for the government to run the technology layers that come on top because that's where a lot of private companies come in. And I agree with Pradeep there that innovation will really drive that. Uh, manufacturing electric cars... Uh, again, will be done by the private sector. Now, who in the private sector does that is up for debate. Uh, but all of those things will have different components. So it's a very large ecosystem with multiple players. The question is, how do they all play together and make it easy for the consumer? And more importantly, make it sustainable for the consumer in future. You mentioned data privacy, though. So how do you see that then? Who's going to be responsible for that? That's where I, I agree with Radeep again, that policy becomes important. So what is the policy around it? That the government has to set. Right? And then how do you enforce that? So London's a great example. Data is shared, but not at the public level, not at the individual level. It's aggregate data. And even within aggregate data, there are certain aspects of it that may not be shared. So how do you set those policies and enforce them becomes important because that way it can be used for good. In fact, just to add one example to that, um, we have something called Uber Movement. Uh, which is a data platform where data in various aggregated, anonymized, uh, non-individually identifiable ways are uh, shared with government agencies. And with the specific purpose 
of getting more efficient at urban planning. I'd argue that any entity that's sitting on that high value data should be used for as much public good as you can. And, and that's a good example, I think, of uh, how data can be used, not just for transport, but, but many other, many other uh, use cases. Megan? Yeah, just maybe a word on, on government. I mean, I think it's clear. Government needs to rethink its role into this new tech-enabled, AI-enabled world, mm -hmm. right? It's a moment where governments across the world need to start rethinking what is our role, where it might have been as a provider before, as an operator, clearly that's not the right space for government to be operating in. They don't have those resources and they can't move at the speed that everything is demanding. The entire tech revolution has increased and accelerated um, the need for innovation at a, at, in a fluid and an ongoing way. So it's clear governments can't move at that rate. So then it becomes a question of how are they going to redefine that role? Are they prepared to truly um, make that kind of innovative step so that they begin to act as a framework, as a policy framework, as a protection framework? It is the government's responsibility to ensure the protection of its citizens and their rights. Well, that gets a little dicey when government is using AI and using our data for their own needs and wants. And, and so, you know, this is where it becomes very important. Again, the three pillars that community fights back and says, actually, you don't have the right to use my data like that. I'm happy for this company to use it in the way it enables some service for me, but I'm not happy to have my behavior predicted and suddenly the government determining what I can and cannot have as an access, um, which is where we could go, right? I mean, if AI starts to predict our movements in that way, um, then we will not have have access to the kinds of transportation mobility we want because they will tell us, well, you don't need that. And so we're not going to, we're not going to make that available to you. So I think this is, it is a very, very uh, difficult space. And I think the only way that it's resolved is if each of the partners in these equations stand strong um, with the end user really the end user and their protection and their welfare as the point of reference. And it has to come back to that over and over. I do have to say that personally, if I were to uh, know that some public entity was going to know my every movement and that every day I go to the grocery store at this hour, every day I go to my office at this hour, or I go from point A to B, uh, quite regularly, who and who am I interacting with, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these things, mobility means so much, not just about me personally moving around, but really my lifestyle. And uh, I must say that I don't know if I really want my lifestyle to be out there so open that everyone can predict what I would be doing next. And I'd argue, Minori, uh, forget transport services. You know, we are all avid users of various services that Google provides. If you have location turned on your phone, it doesn't matter whether you're taking transport option A, B, or C, it is available, right? And I think there is a ton of work to be done uh, because that information can be used for good for you mm -hmm. and for society. It also can be used in ways that are not good. And so I think the reflection for us collectively is we have to, this, and this can't be only the government's job. We all have to come together. Anish, you made the point around the ecosystem coming together. Everybody bears responsibility to make sure that this is used in a way that's productive. I also, well, we are beginning to wrap up this session, but um, of course, Moz is a service because that's what the word means. And so we've been saying, yes, it has to be sustainable, it must be inclusive, but, and Megan, you mentioned aspiration, but can we really, um, how should I say this, ask people to choose a more green option or how can we make people want to take that different option that would be more sustainable, that would be more inclusive? Um, I do have to say that we talked about disabilities, for example. Sometimes it is easier for someone with a physical disability to take a certain mode of personal transport because it would be customed for them. Uh, but how can we expect in a more public realm that um, Moss is for those sorts of people to take that option instead of their personal vehicle or whatever that mode of transport, which is custom to them, be easier to use? I'd say we have to find a way to make it simpler for folks and more affordable. 
people will make economic choices that are best for them. But if you've got a brand new metro in Delhi and that's much faster to take you from your home to office and it takes you two hours by car and it takes you 40 minutes by metro and it's clean and nice, you'll take it. Right? Would people really take that? Uh, <laughs> a lot of people are. Right? A lot of friends I have in Delhi have switched to metro because it's much easier from that standpoint. Now, what you also have to solve for is what happens at the last mile on both ends. So till you solve that, that's why the solutions have to be there. And that's what we've got to work for as an ecosystem, yeah, to put I the think, solutions in place. I, mean, I didn't mean right. to interrupt, Anish, please. Oh, no, go ahead. I, I, just to build on your thought, right. you, you hit the nail on its head. You have to have the end consumer convenience in mind. Because remember, you're spending hours of your daily life on the road trying to get to point A to point B. You're not doing this for fun. It's not a fun experience. It's a functional need, which means it has to be incredibly efficient and it has to be affordable. The visual that we have often in mind is one that says, you press a button and you get a ride. But that ride has to take you all the way to the end point. And that may be that you have a two-wheeler picking you from your house. Somebody comes because you pressed a button. That person shows up, takes you to the metro station. You have cashless ways of getting in and the physical environment is good. You get into the metro and you're not getting jostled out. And you have some degree of comfort and I think that's important and you get off, the same thing has to happen at the back end. You don't need to be standing on a crowded street trying to hail an auto rickshaw and haggling with... That's an incredibly inconvenient experience. And I think we have ways to be able to stitch all this, but different people have to play different roles in stitching that together. If you put the end user in your mind and provide this day in, day out, ride in, ride out, travel after travel, adoption I don't see as an issue. To me, electric is part of the same solution. If you make electric easily accessible, just visualize a world where all uh, oil stations become EV charging points. That could happen. If that were to happen, I'm sure there will be much greater adoption, much faster, and because it's fundamentally cheaper. And I'd, I'd say that people you give people two equal choices, they will make the healthier choice. We see that with food already. Uh, and so I think that uh, I'm very optimistic that uh, that can happen. But then that too is incentive, isn't it, for governments to want to give incentive to, for example, companies like oil companies to switch over to those charging systems. Go yeah, ahead. Incentives will play a key role. It's the cost of ownership. So if you look at electric anywhere in the world, governments have given incentives for Years. companies and individuals to start switching to electric. But just to expand on what we were talking about and what Pradeep mentioned, not just at the metro level, we've started a service again as a smaller pilot that takes people in a ride-sharing car from a certain point in Mumbai to a certain other point. So it could be home hubs to office hubs. And that's in an electric car, right? Now that's set up as a shared service. Each seat is set up as a business class seat in an airplane with your own monitor, with Wi-Fi, with a bunch of things around you. And you have the privacy in your own seat and you have an electric car. Now, Yes, consumers would pay a little more for that, but there's a very high demand for that today. But again, if you offer convenience, and if you offer a better outcome, then people will take it. Uh, but I want to also add one more thing. In all our conversation, while we're talking about congestion and pollution, uh, we've been only talking about passenger transport. Mm -hmm. The other big equation here is goods transport. Yes. Right? You've got a very large number of trucks in our cities going from point A to point B and coming back empty. Right. So how do you start addressing that problem of goods mobility? And that will be a big factor in, in this whole equation of reducing congestion and reducing pollution. Okay. I'm a pessimist. I think until we have a carbon tax, until it starts to hit the bottom line, until cities are no longer able to borrow money at concessional rates for building of infrastructure without moving decisively towards a more sustainable mobility system. I think we're just not going to get the speed or the uptake that we need. So I'm a bit pessimistic in this moment. Well, that's the other part. Um, well, as I mentioned a bit earlier, I talked about rural areas, but uh, the incentive for governments, for example, to push uh, well, or businesses to expand in those areas uh, there's got to be something in place for them to, to look in that direction or else they won't. And that will leave a very big population behind. Uh, maybe not in number, but, you know, uh, in terms of social divides or, you know, we will be 
at the end of, we will be cutting them off from uh, a lot of uh, possibilities. So again, I mean, you know, we talk The only incentives. thing I would say mm -hmm. is that I really deeply believe that the market innovates. It's to come mm. back to what you said. I think that's the beauty of, of the market and market-based solutions is that they take all the barriers, they look at them, and they find the way through to be successful, right? This is, this is how we are as human beings. So I think it's about setting the bar higher, about putting out there where we want to be in 2020 or 2030 or 2050 and saying, okay, now we innovate to that. The problem has been we continue to set the bar too low and, and then we don't get very far, um, as if we're kind of afraid to say, let's actually make tough rules. I think tough rules are okay because I think the market will absolutely adapt and absolutely innovate to those rules. Um, we sell ourselves short often, and I, that especially happens in rural areas. Um, it's kind of still cowboy land um, mm. in the rural parts of the global south. And, and they can adapt to rules, um, both the human beings who live there and the companies that serve those areas and need to serve them. So then, in a way, then we are talking about leadership from the business sector. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and government and the policy sector. Yeah, I, I am an optimist. I think a lot is <laughs> happening. Right? We have a company called Lithium that has taken 800 electric cars in Bangalore and are transporting people from their homes to offices every day. Now, could that 800 be 8,000? Yes, absolutely. We need to move faster. But the point is you have a startup doing that. Right? Uh, electric rickshaws are taking over. Right? In a year or two, uh, you're going to have a higher proportion of electric rickshaws and non-electric rickshaws sold. So you're starting to see cost of ownership become affordable for fleets first, for three-wheelers first, and then even for four-wheelers for fleets, and then it will move to consumers. So I see a tremendous momentum, and uh, it can be faster, but at least it's headed in the right direction. Pretty? Um, I, I wouldn't be doing what I do if I wasn't an optimist. <laughs> uh, it is tough to do transportation uh, in the physical world. It's not a pure digital service. And um, what I will say is just consumer adoption of these things have been so amazing around every city. We operate in 650 odd cities. Every city, people have just lapped on because there is something inherently good, affordable, important about sharing that I think people are just latching on to. Uh, the faster we can push that, the more we can get the full ecosystem to go uh, collaborate. Uh, I'm optimistic that we'll make, uh, make a difference. Uh, I'm with Megan that there may be tough rules required uh, and maybe we've just not been hard enough. Congestion tax, by the way, is a great example. It's show, showing up in uh, quite a few locations. Uh, so I'm sure there will be many cities that will try and we'll learn uh, from that. Uh, but I'm an optimist that we will uh, we'll make a difference today more than I was growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully we can all collaborate to, to get there faster. Okay. Just one last word from each of you before I open up the floor for questions, um, starting with uh, Anish. Um, well, I'll be asking the same thing of three of you. But um, as we've been discussing, I can see how Moss is still a relatively new concept. Um, there are certain rules in place for transportation, but on the other hand, so much more is possible. Uh, certain rules and regulations are actually still not there, and therefore I think we've been talking about tougher rules. But for you, um, what do you see as the biggest motivation for driving Moss forward? I see the biggest motivation to be enhanced expectations from consumers. In this world of technology, I see them changing their view. What is available is not enough. Right? I'm not going to settle with what I have. I want something more. And that combined with innovation, where someone's going to come in and offer that something more, is really what's exciting. For me, it's, it's the concept that with a platform like Mass that is actually workable for everybody, you completely unlock people's ability to attain their own aspirations, 
to move from here to there because that's where the job is that they want to do or that's where the family member is they want to support or that's where a child needs to go to school. I think it's the ultimate tool for unlocking social mobility and economic mobility for those who are currently disproportionately disadvantaged by not having access to good transportation. You know, with your permission, I'll build on what you said, Megan, and uh, share a story. This is just from last week. We had a chance to spend time with uh, the principal scientific advisor uh, to the government of India, uh, and he gave us a fabulous story. He said, uh, in his mind, uh, entrance examinations into the most coveted engineering institutes in India has substantial underrepresentation of women. Uh, and as they work through kind of why that happens, one of the interesting things he said is women just don't show up to coaching classes the way men do, and they don't invest as much. And there are other reasons, but one of the interesting things he said is most of the classes are in the evening. And in most cities, families just don't want to let uh, young women out because they just don't trust that the transit transportation solutions available today are good enough. And he was just making this a point around social mobility. He made the other observation as he looked out of his office and he said, this is the prime commercial location in India. And he looks out of that and look at the working population. He says, less than one out of five people here is a woman. And that participation is still very low in large parts of the world. And there is a develop, developing divide uh, there. I think I'm optimistic because frankly, we won't have a choice. And transport has a very, very important role to drive uh, inclusivity in our in our society. So um, again, I think we will see a lot more than we have seen in the last, uh, call it half a decade. Uh, the next decade should be quite exciting. Well, thank you to the panelists because yes, we touched upon so many different issues related to sustainable mobility being, well, security, data, um, education, uh, crossing social divides because it may provide more means of transport for people who didn't have access. Yet again, regulations, where are we going to go with that? And um, it is exciting to know that because it's such a new uh, framework that there's so much more that can be done, but because there's so much more that can be done, we really, on the consumer side as well, need to make the right decisions. Thank you, and I'd like to open up the floor for Q and A's. Oh, uh, well, could we? Sorry, the hand went up first. Thank you. My name is Philippe Bonnier from La Gefi, Switzerland. I have a question to Mr. Shah. I understand that Mahindra is strongly involved in this project of smart cities. Could you tell us something about it on how it could solve the mobility problem? on whether you would include all those, what has been implemented in Singapore, like the, the auction for, for the car plate, or if you enter some specific area of the city, you have to pay a special price to avoid congestion. So we have been building townships for the last 25 years now. Uh, and um, we've got a number of lessons from that in terms of how to build one, what are the interactions between uh, professional life and personal life that need to be put in place, etc. There's a lot more that needs to be done around policy. And that, frankly, is a partnership with the government on are they willing to put in certain zones. And technology today hasn't reached that level as yet. There are various cities that are experimenting with it to have a zone for automated cars only. And my sense is that's still about five to ten years away. Um, it, it will take a while for us to get there. It's going to be easier to put in the taxes that you talked about or the penalties for congestion tax, but to have a truly smart city with automated trans uh, transportation uh, is still a little while away. Do we have time for one more question? Or Okay, I'm very sorry. Um, you might want to approach the panelists uh, individually, uh, but we do have to wrap up this session. Thank you all for coming. And uh, yes, we hope you get to uh, meet and talk with them individually. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. And thank you, Anish. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.